Hey everybody, Red Mage here. Welcome back to this series where I go through different RPG products that I have and give them a quick flip through and review. In this one, I'm going to be going through the Cairn 2nd Edition box set. Basically, this is all the stuff that came, this is all in PDF form, but it's all the stuff that came uh, together when I kickstarted the Cairn set at a pretty high level. I don't think it was the highest level, but I, I got as much as I could, basically. The physical stuff's going to be coming out sometime the next year, but the digital PDFs are all done. These are all the 1.0 editions. And so I wanted to click through them and uh, give you guys a sense of what they're like, because they're awesome. I have had a really soft spot for a long time now for Cairn Adventures. I think that Cairn, some of the most creative short adventures out there are for Cairn. That they appeal to me in my in my aesthetic, you know, <laughs> preferences. They appeal to me very often in the design preferences, the whimsy that often goes along with Cairn, the, the sudden darkness that can appear in Cairn Adventures. I just some of the best adventures I've reviewed have been Cairn Adventures, and so I. I hadn't, I had never played the first edition. I had just, when I started the channel almost a year ago now, started going through trying to find good adventures and, and I was really, really happy with what I found with Cairn. So I backed the second edition and I'm really happy that I did. I think you guys are gonna really like <laughs> what this stuff is. So I recommend you guys check it out if you haven't already. So here's what you're gonna, we're gonna look through today. We're gonna look through the player's guide, which is the second edition. This is 88 pages in the PDF. We're gonna look at the warden's guide, which is, uh, 192 pages. This one is just amazing, full of great advice, great tables for building your own adventures. It's not like a, a standard GM's guide or DM's guide. It's a really good adventure campaign monster creator. Great, great uh, book. And then I'm going to be going through two adventure anthologies, um, or rather an adventure anthology one, uh, which is great weird cover for it. I think this one has three adventures in it. And then I'm going to go through the Trouble in Twin Lakes, which is a single adventure. It's the Adventure Series 1 for Karn, Karen 2nd Edition. Um, and then I'll just, there's, it came with a screen, which I can go through, uh, and then two character sheets. Uh, in, but that's just, you know, different files that came. But let's look at the, let's look at the main books. Let's start with those. So here's the Kane, Karen Player's Guide. Um, and it's, it's what you might expect from a player's guide. It's all hyperlinked, which is great. I'm glad, glad, glad. <laughs> hyperlinked uh, tables of contents are my thing. Um, you get a nice overview of Karen itself. Neutrality, that's the GM. So these are the different design philosophies. So neutrality, it's classless, death, fiction first, growth, player choice, principles, and shared objectives. That's a great breakdown of this particular system. Here are the principles for players. This is a player's guide, so the player should have this. Agency, teamwork, exploration, talking, caution, planning, and ambition. Those are great old school, I mean really those are old school, I would say, um, design principles. But it's great that they have them for Karen here. Section one is character creation. I love the art in this book. It's very subdued. It's not, I mean, the covers are kind of bold, but the rest of the book throughout is not, yeah, it's the sort of almost, um, what do you call that? Um, where it's from the side, uh, those little uh, miniature portraits they used to do. It kind of has that, the silhouette portraits. I forget what they call them. Uh, there's a word I'm looking for there, though. Creating a background. Rolling back, background attributes and how you generate those. D20 backgrounds. How you generate your attributes and what they are. Hit protection, so HP, what that means. Um, inventory and inventory slots, how that works. Here's your character traits. D10 physique, D10 skin, D10 hair, D10 face. Speech, clothing, virtue, and vice. Then you get uh, bonds, which are great ways of kind of connecting your character to the world, the fiction, giving yourself uh, an interesting thing for you to enter into. It's a little bit like combining trinkets and bonds from D&D 5e. I really, really like that. That um, your bonds in 5e were really, I think, underused. And so were the trinkets. The trinket table in D&D in &D 5e that you were supposed to start with a random trinket. It was a great little trick, a little, a little way of connecting your character and giving, your, giving you something into the world. Um, but it wasn't developed enough. I think this is a great, um, uh, you know, pointing that direction, basically. D20 bonds. D20 omens. Um, that's a great little thing you can add in. Folks say that a faint laughter can be heard echoing out of wells all over the city, and that the echoes change to sobs at night. And that's interesting. If you were to roll an omen like this for your character at level one, um, or choose, I suppose, as a player, that would be a really interesting uh, way of playing the game. 
it wouldn't it would you know it's it's more like shared fiction where you're generating stuff that the GM DM didn't necessarily plan on. The fact that it's a table in the player's guide in the character generation section means I assume that you roll this randomly for each character. Um, yeah, or at least that you could or something like that. That's an interesting way of doing it. Uh, different marketplace costs, and different things you can get, and backgrounds. More detail on the backgrounds. R effects, barber surgeon. So one of the things that they have here, right, is that there's a basic breakdown of the background and the possible names for that background, which is interesting. Uh, starting gear for that background, and then some tables specific to that background. Right? What experiment went horribly wrong? What alchemical marvel is the product of your latest ingenuity? That's true for each of these. So have you improved yourself? What rare tool is essential to your work? The beast handler. What creature is your specialty? What do creatures of the wild understand that your kind do not? So you get um, these really cool, I love the bone keeper. You get these really cool um, variations of each background. Um, they're not quite classes, right? They're not quite gonna give you tons of abilities, but they are gonna give you some differentiation as you start. So yes, it's classless, but it's not totally, you know, um, it's not nave levels of character design and generation. You do get some more specific, almost class-related abilities or something like that. Or, or not abilities is the wrong word. Uh, more like class-related flavor. But it's also mechanical. There's, there's less distinction in Karen between flavor and mechanics, which I really, really like. The Cut Purse, the Field Warden, the Fletchwind, Foundling, Fungal Forager, Greenwise, the Half Witch, the Hexen Vane, the Jongler, the Kettlewright, the March Guard, the Mountbank, the Outrider, the Prowler, the Rill Runner, the Scrivener. I want to be a Scrivener. <laughs> uh, Bartleby the Scrivener is one of my favorite short stories. Uh, rules How to play the game. The core rules, your attributes, your saves, healing recovery, and deprivation and fatigue. It's a d20 system, and it's very, very simple. If you roll equal to or under your attribute, you succeed. Otherwise, you fail. One is always a success, a 20 is always a failure. Not a huge fan of roll under systems. I've talked about that in the past, but I'm totally okay with them. Um, or I'm becoming more and more okay with them, I suppose. I, I definitely see there's a lot of good there. When you're generating a character with a 3d6, I'm a little bit less okay with roll under systems because I just don't like games where if you happen to roll an 18 you have a 10% chance of failure in that regard for the rest of your character's life. Um, I'm not as much a fan of that sort of system. So I like either curved systems or generation systems that use a different kind of generation like 3d4 uh, plus 2 or something like that which I've seen right. So you're going to get between 5 and 14. That's a bit better. Uh, there are other ways of generating stats for a roll-under system that I prefer, other than 3d6 and then just a straight roll-under system. Uh, armor and how that works, reaction tables, morale, hirelings, and the die of fate. It's a d6. <laughs> uh, how combat works, rounds, actions, attacking and damage, and attack modifiers. So you, uh, you roll your weapon, die when, weapon dice when you attack, and you subtract the target's armor. So it's an automatic hit. Uh, subtracted damage. Much faster that way. M a bit more lethal, especially if you're not armored heavily. Critical damage, attribute loss, etc, etc. Uh, scars, so when you go to zero hit points, you roll on this table to see what your lasting scar is. Um, magic, and how magic works. Magic in Cairn is spellbook based, and each spell is uh, each spell book contains one spell and takes up a slot. So that's how you kind of make your classes differenti differentiated, right? If you if you want to fill up your spell book, if you want to become a really powerful wizard, you just need a lot of spell books, which means you need a lot of uh, you need a lot of uh, inventory space. That's that's it. Uh, procedures, dungeon exploration, and how that works: the turn of exploration, the basics, dungeon exploration cycle, dungeon events that can occur. So. As you go through, you need to roll a d6. Encounter, sign, environment, loss, exhaustion, and quiet. Those are good. I like that not, you know, very often people have a, a random encounter is simply a random encounter, and you, you just either don't have any event or a random encounter, and usually those are hostile with, you know, variations on reactions. So Shadow Dark works. Mostly you're going to be encountering creatures, and those creatures are probably going to be hostile with some 
with some chance that they're not. Um, old school essentials does it more. You know, more. Di- uh, I know it's different there. You have a much higher chance of it being neutral or non-hostile in old school essentials than you do in shadow dark. Five uh, e basically, if you have a random encounter, it's almost always set by the DM or it's a fight. Um, but Karen does it more interestingly, right? You have a you, when you encounter something or when you're going to have a random encounter roll. Instead, you roll on the table, and there's a one in six chance of an encounter. Otherwise, something happens. And there is a chance also that nothing happens with the six, but uh, you have to consume a ration, take fatigue. Uh, there's a loss, environment, sign. I like that. It's more variation there, less combat heavy. Uh, actions that you can take in the dungeon: searching, resting, panic. What happens when you panic in the dungeon? Elements like light, doors, traps, wilderness exploration. How that works differently from land. Um, it assumes point crawls as opposed to hex crawls, which is cool. Potential destinations on a map are called points. So you're assuming that they're going to be traveling between points. I like that better, point crawl. I like hex crawls, don't, let, don't get me wrong, but I do think point crawls are probably ultimately more... I think they're probably better at a table, ultimately. I'd have to think about that. I might make a video at some point about different kinds of design elements, um, and that's one of them, the difference between hex crawls and point crawls and what you can expect and why you might do one over the other. If that sounds interesting, let me know, because um, I can do a video on that. Weather... Wilderness elements, wilderness exploration cycle, wilderness actions, and then downtime, and how that works. Milestones, costs, um, downtime actions like research, training, strengthening ties. And then the setting. There's a, a, a an implied setting or a built-in setting uh, from a lot of this stuff. And Vald is the uh, yeah the implied setting of Karen. And so there's some stuff about that here. Um, there's the wood, the roots, and that's it. So it's a very short little section in the back about the setting of Vault. Basically what you would need to know in order to develop it on your own. That's basically it. And it's more fairy tale, right? It's more wild. The wood is populated by creatures strange and wondrous, such as goblins, spirits, treants, trolls, werewolves, witches, and even talking plants and animals. It's not empty of people. And then the roots go down beneath the earth. Gates are scattered across the land. Only the brave and foolish enter the roots, and most do not return. It's a great little... Um, description there. So that's the back cover, obviously. So Cairn, 2nd Edition Player's Guide. Really great stuff. I mean, if you're going to play the game, you'd need this, <laughs> at least on some level. There's a lot of good stuff here um, in the backgrounds and in the rules and just... But it's it's pretty simple. It's pretty straightforward. It's not that hard to, uh, to digest. One read-through and you know how to run this game. There aren't a lot of complicated systems or subsystems. Looking at the Warden's Guide, I am really impressed. Just really, really impressed with the Warden's Guide. So once again, we get uh, a uh, hyperlinked... Oh no, this is not... Oh yeah, this section. some of the sections are hyperlinked, uh, but not every entry or sub-entry, which is kind of weird. Um, or you can click on this. Yeah, this is all... So it's not... The names aren't hyperlinked. <laughs> I was wondering about that. The numbers aren't hyperlinked. The names aren't hyperlinked. The dots are. So that'll take you to the section that you want, <laughs> which is interesting. But you have divided into three sections. Uh, you have world building, warden tools, and then advice and examples. And the advice and examples section is pretty short, but it's also got a lot of great information there about the setting and stuff like that. So it's a bit more detail than the player's guide, which is very simple, right? The player's guide just tells the players a little bit about the implied setting. But the stuff that you get in here is really, really good. Really, really good. Procedures for generating your own settings, maps, factions, dungeons, and forests. There is a lot of great information in here. So, setting seeds the overview of this section, the realm and regions, and the material required and how to enter into it. Region theme, D20 culture, D20 uh, uh, resources, and two for each, so character and ambition, abundance and scarcity. Altruistic power. You could have a, a culture that is stoic and peace-loving, or enlightened and uh, controlling, or artistic and bountiful, or xenophobic and stable. Right, you can just create your your own uh, your own cultures there really quickly, and then same for resources. This land is full of food and doesn't have much food, <laughs> but you can roll twice, you get the same result. Maybe there's an interesting abundance of one kind and a scarcity of another, or or maybe you just happen to roll different things. Right, so there's an abundance of skilled labor, but there's an there's a scarcity of water. I don't know how that works. The different factions, so you have agents, advantages, and agendas. The three A's. Um, agents are the people who are going to be in charge agendas, and then you have obstacles that that, that, that um, faction is going to try to overcome too. So the faction type, uh, a mystic 
who is the agent for an artisan guild, or an assassin who is the agent for the revolutionaries, or a thug who is the agent for the settlers. Interesting factions already, just that one agent and faction. The fact, for example, that a settler, the settlers have a thug as their agent is kind of an interesting idea. The faction traits. Trait 1 and trait 2. And you have faction advantages. I roll 2d20. The first for the number the advantage has, and the second for the type of advantage. So, how many advantages do they have? They have four advantages. They could have beliefs, fealty, popularity, and wealth. Or alliances, anonymity, renown, or subterfuge. Or maybe it's a, it's a faction with only one advantage. That will tell you how important the faction is in your world, to some extent. And then the agendas, what they're trying to do. And the obstacle to achieving that agenda. So, just in a few pages, you have great, simple faction generation. And if you're going to build a world and you want to get started, this is an excellent way to do it just at the beginning without having to do a lot of cross-tabling and, you know, rolling on sub-tables and going on and on and on and on. Some people love that. I tend to like that. But if you have a really, I mean, this is just a great brief faction generation. This is the sort of thing that I would want to put into my uh, GM's binder, which I probably will. Here's an example faction. Great. The Academics, the Royal Cartographer's Guild, respected and feared even by the royal family. That's interesting. They have a map of the dead, and their renown is quite wide. Their agent is Horatia Confi, recovered the map of the dead from the guild. The agendas are hire a skilled party to escort Horatia to the location on the map, travel through the lands of the dead, bring the founder back to the cities, and has been warned that a well-placed operative moves within its ranks. There's a spy within it. That's great. Faction rules and how they operate their actions and the consequences of those actions and the impact of those actions on the world. Topography, generating the world, terrain type, with a die drop table, and then you build your area with a die drop, a few D6s, you know the kind of land that is and the, uh, the difficulty of it. Uh, there's terrain and landmarks, if you want to make them uh, a bit more varied. Right? Tough and perilous landmarks. Rivers, seas, and lakes, weather, unusual weather great great tables for world building settlement tables waypoint tables curiosity tables layer tables dungeon tables how to generate paths path features terrain difficulty putting it all together 30 pages of excellent wilderness generation but then you have the dungeon section dungeon seeds what are the principles you need to have purpose levels layout verticality oh that's a very important one that people often ignore Verticality is probably the number one thing that makes me drawn to a dungeon map or to a dungeon de de description is verticality. It's so much more interesting than just horizontal one floor dungeon. I mean, honestly, people need to stop doing one floor dungeons that are made like a hero quest map. Like I, I get why they do it. I like hero quest maps. I like those games, but dungeons with verticality, so much more interesting. It's just a different, <laughs> it's a different level. No pun intended. All right. Secret areas, rooms, treasure, and challenges. NPCs, faction, puzzles, the dungeon map, room king, and encounter tables. So how to create a dungeon, the materials you required, and the overview. The history of your dungeon, the construction of your dungeon, the ruination of your dungeon, the dungeon denizens, denizen traits, dungeon factions, and their agendas. How to build a dungeon. Die drop tables. Build your dungeon here. Monster rooms. Group and activity. Room type and clues. Special rooms, features, trap rooms, and the trigger. Example dungeon. You get a whole dungeon built out. The fractured temple. You get a, a pre-made dungeon for you right here, if you want to use it. Forest seeds, how to generate a forest. Description of your forest, virtues and vices of the spirit of the forest, what it's like. The forest agenda. POIs places of interest in your forest trail types types and markers monsters ruins features shelters hazards I mean, on and on and on generating your dungeon it's basically a dungeon right that's what you're doing when you generate a forest you're generating a big overland dungeon warden tools a collection of tools including a bestiary uh, procedures for creating and converting monsters spell books naming character advancement and advice the bestiary, a lot of horrifying monsters in here with some great pieces of art for some of the monsters. Not all the monsters get art, but it's really evocative and particular kinds of art for these creatures. 
like the Crypt Guardian. Not everybody's gonna like that, but it's the sort of art, I don't know, you might be able to show your players as like, written on a, like you're drawn on a tomb wall or something like that, like it's kind of primitive. Um, but again, it, it's evocative and it, it, certainly, it certainly lets you, the DM, know what the thing is in terms of its description, the Eye of Terror. That's an interesting way of doing uh, Beholders. <laughs> the Gargoyle. Knolls, I like the knoll there. That's a great piece of art. The Green Dragon, that's a good one too. Griffins and Harpies. Standard monsters that you're going to get in almost any monster manual, but done in the uh, Cairn stat blocks and for the rules there. And as you can see, the, the Cairn stat blocks are exceedingly easy, which is just huge. I love easy stat blocks. And you could just copy and paste these onto your map or just print out the page and you'd have it right there. Or you just, I mean, it's you write it out in two seconds. So easy. Love, love, love easy stat blocks. How to create monsters. Rules for doing that with tables for the generation of them. How to convert monsters from other systems. Monster categories, naming procedures for your game. This is just for your game generally, not for your monsters, but for basically anything. Terrain, adjectives, nouns, D100 tables for all of that. Faction names, realm names, forest names. Again, with more tables for adjectives and nouns. Growth. Do not reward players for killing monsters, looting treasure, or exploring new places. Instead, it is the character's unique experience in the game that has the potential to alter their health, abilities, beliefs, bonds, and even their minds. So, how do you advance your characters in a game without XP in those traditional ways? It's really cool ideas. How do you grow your characters? And an example of a developing character. Or of developing characters, I should say. Uh, spellbooks. Uh, there's a D100 list of spellbooks with the spells that are coming from them, but then you can come up with your own very easily, and rules for that. Uh, reliquaries, so you know, special magic items that you can find. Some really cool ones in here. And then advice and examples, which is the last section of the book. Um, how to create backgrounds if you want to create one for your campaign, which is highly recommended, right? Point crawls and how to convert a map into a point crawl. Great idea. Great advice there. Frequently asked questions. Dungeon principles. Um, why you include different areas, all right, and what you should do with those areas. How you use detachments, like large groups of entity, enemies that you're treating as a single entity. Um, so, you know, mass combat rules, basically. Wilderness exploration, how that works, bonds and omens, knowledge and perception, saves, advice on all the different areas of the game, variable difficulty. And I like it because it's practical advice about how to do particular things that are specific to this game. That's the kind of advice that is needed in, you know, warden books or gm books or dm books not generic advice on how to engage your players at the table it's like yeah i mean they're okay fine that a little bit of that is necessary or maybe early on but you can find so much of that online you don't want to waste time in your book with that sort of advice instead give advice to the player about how to run this game and what makes this game different the different uh, you know, advice about the world and how the world works uh, the setting itself, the calendar of Vald, which is great. Six days of the week. There's a reclamation week, week once per decade. Um, and the other months. NPC tables. Lots of great tables here for generating your NPCs very quickly. Holidays, festivals, and events. Great, great, great. Your game should have holidays. And then the bibliography at the back, with a lot of great stuff to read and to you know proceed forward here. A lot of them are very, very good. Highly recommend you guys check these, these out. And then the back of the Karen book. So this is just a fantastic, fantastic set of books. The Player Book and the Warden's Guide. Um, I'm, really, I'm only going to go through the Adventure Anthologies and the Adventure just very briefly because uh, going a little long in the video, this is 64 pages. I'm not going to go through it in detail. I haven't played through these adventures at all. I'm just going to show you what they really have. Dread Hospitality the Blood Marm Barrow, and the Tide Returning. And it gives you a, a little bit of information about each one right away. A uh, mansion adventure that explores the grotesque, solipsistic nature of power and greed. That's Dread Hospitality. Blood Marm Barrow is a player character will investigate strange and supernatural happenings in a remote burial mound where bandits lurk and a powerful extraplanar creature secret dwells. And then three, the Tide Returning is, this is a campaign setting and a hex crawl set in a vast mangrove wood punctuated by giant building-sized trees. That's great. Dread Hospitality, um, 
and the situation, what's really happening, the adventure hook, what could happen if nothing changes. I like those. I always like it if, if players do nothing, what happens? D10 rumor tables, important NPCs, impressions. So it's laid out very well. Great dungeon map here for Agonius Hall. And then the description itself with everything clearly drawn on the map. And uh, as you go through, it's pretty easy to find out where things are. Now the map is repeated at times, but uh, it would be nice to have it a little more frequently, but it's really every other page anyway. It's not a big deal. Um, you get a bestiary for this particular adventure. Blood Marm Barrow. It's a very different look, and each of these have different looks because they're generated by different people. Um, some people are going to prefer one to the other, obviously, just in terms of their aesthetic appearance. I don't like the text so much on this one. I like the map a little better. Um, I like the fact that there's art given throughout. Um, <laughs> the Blood Marm itself... Um, yeah. Bloody quartz cavern and a blood well. Gross. There's a flesh palace and a blood sea. Pretty gross. And then the tide returning. You get a uh, hex crawl there. Map of the Great Wood. It's a little hard to see what's going on here, but I think once you read through the map, you'll get a description of each of the hexes, and then you'll be able to look back at the map and go, oh, yeah, that's right. That's what's here, and that's what's there. It looks. You know, the different things are being drawn on the map. Some of them are clear, but others are a little bit muddy and messy to me. <laughs> Great Brother Kite, Rebel Raptor. Great piece of art for that dude. And you get just a description of each of the places, what you're looking at here. Pretty straightforward. Um, it's the first adven official adventure anthology for Cairn. Number one, so we'll hopefully be more. Um, there's another one here. This is uh, an adventure module by Yokai Gall. Um, Trouble in Twin Lakes. It's again pretty straightforward. Um, there is, you know, what's going on here. What appears at first to be a set of interconnected events are instead simple coincidences. Um, Alder, Alder's fate and that of the man, the dead mill are in fact completely unrelated. <laughs> so the stuff that's going on here it looks like there's a connection, but in fact there isn't. And the players are going to kind of run from one to the other and find out about that. There's a great map here. I like the region map here. West Lake and East Lake. Twin Lakes. Rumors, encounters, Isthmus Town. Great. Little maps of each of these locations as you go through. I like that a lot. So there's a lot of cool locations here. Uh, I really like this adventure. Uh, it's a place to explore, a place to go around. It's a great starting a campaign setting or... Uh, location. There's a lot of cool stuff here going on. And a lot of stuff players can, can run into and do. So, a uh, standalone adventure. Pretty short. But there is a lot of a lot of material here for a few quite a few sessions, I would think. And then the, the box set also came with a warden screen. So you see the NPC tables, procedures, rule summary procedures, and marketplace. So great. Very simple, um, but uh, very useful. And this is what the screen looks like on the other side. It's got a very particular art style. I like it. I think it fits with the Karen books as a whole, with the setting, with the vibe. Not everyone's going to like this particular style, but I like it, especially like the goblins in the background. They're creepy. They look like cartoony, less disturbing Pathfinder goblins, which I appreciate. And then there's the two character sheets. This is the vertical and then the uh, horizontal. I like this one really a lot. I love, the, I love the art here. It's a different style of art than the screen, and that might create a little bit of a of a contrast there. So if you don't want, I don't know, I prefer, overall, I definitely prefer this style of art, the old school pen and ink, you know, line and ink art. Um, looks like old, you know, old, uh, old books that I read when I was a kid. And so I prefer this style, but not everyone does. And I think uh, it's not gonna bother some people that you're gonna have this kind of, this style of art on the character, sh uh, on the uh, screen, this style on the character sheet. It might have been cool to have a consistency there, and I'm sure that at some point you could you can get character sheets that have this style of art, or, or just blank, you know, just very simple sheets. Or maybe screens that are a bit more, um, a bit more, I don't know, a bit more in this style. Anyway, this is the Cairn 2nd Edition, uh, collection. Um, it's at least available in its 1.0 to those who have backed it. I, I'll put links below to where you can find out more about this. Highly recommend you guys check this out. Karen is awesome. The adventures that I've reviewed in the past are really, really good. And this system is now, it's something that I definitely want to try out more. Um, I've, I've drawn a lot of inspiration from Karen, but I think I would like to actually try it 
All right, guys. Well, that'll do it for this video. See you all in another one.